Okay, everyone, welcome to our Life Skills Academy workshop today. It's anywhere but my parents' basement, how to move out of your uh, home into your first apartment. So uh, just before we start, just a couple things. This is part of our Life Skills Academy program. So I'm trying to teach you all these sort of basic skills that will help you when you graduate from high school, when you go to college, or your first job, or whatever. If you're already in college, you're already working, hopefully this will help you out as well. Uh, our next session is going to be in two weeks on August 26th, and that's going to be on Home Survival 101. So it's a kind of nice pair with this. Once you've moved out, how do you start actually living on yourself? Brief biography about me. My name is Eric Berman. I'm a teen librarian here. This is my daily wear, you know. This is my afternoon wear. Um, <laughs> maybe wondering what qualifications I have to teach you how to move out of your first apartment, or into your first apartment. Uh, I just did that in March, so it's fresh. It's raw, the good and the bad is still in my mind, so I'm a great resource to help you with this. And um, if you have any questions at the end, I'm happy to talk about that, share my experiences, and I uh, give you some advice. So, to start with, when you're, when you're looking for an apartment, the most important thing to know is have a really clear idea of what you want to do beforehand. So, you need to have a list of your ideas and preferences in mind before you even start looking. So the first and most important one is a budget. How much can you afford to spend on this? Are you, are you rolling in the deep? Do you have a ton of money? Uh, are you really trying to scrape by? Because that's going to afford where you look, what type of material, what sort of apartments you want, and um, also just like the amenities, how close it is to highways, all that sort of thing. Second thing you want to know is roommates. Do you want to live with a roommate? Can you live with a roommate? If you move in with a roommate, it's probably going to be cheaper. If you move in the roommate with a bunch of people in like a house, the rent will be a lot cheaper than renting a single apartment by yourself. But then you have to deal with other people. And sometimes that's good. Sometimes that's bad. I knew several of my friends that all went together and they all rented a house together and they lived there for several years. Half the time they had a great time, half the time they drove each other nuts. Uh, personally, I used to live in a house that I was renting a room in with another family. And I thought it was okay until I left and I realized how awful it had actually been. They did all these little passive aggressive things that I didn't even really notice. Like, if ever I cooked, they would turn the TV up loud so I wouldn't want to stay in that area. Um, they would always move my things slightly, not enough to complain, but enough that I'd notice. So that's something you have to deal with if you're moving people. The location. What type of location? Do you want to live in a house? Do you want to live in an apartment complex? There's some apartment complexes that are very nice and scripted and planned with gated communities. Some of them are basically just a box with a bunch of hotel rooms in them. Those all have their different strengths and weaknesses. <clears throat> What's the neighborhood like? You know, San Jose is a huge city and there's a lot of different types of areas in San Jose. The downtown's really different from the east side or the north side or the south side or the west side. And even within those areas, you have very different experiences depending where you live. So it's really important to research and know about where those are. How are you getting to where your job is, your school is? That's another important thing. So I'll say right now, I live about 10 times further away than where I, where I used to live from my work. But it's actually about five minutes faster to get there. And that's because there's less side streets and there's less traffic, especially during morning and afternoon commutes. You have to know about that. If you don't have a car right now, or you don't want a car, you have to think about bus routes and um, transit lanes and walking paths. Is there a Target or a Safeway or a grocery store near you? Or do you have to walk like 10 miles? You know, I used to live right next to a 7-Eleven. That was so nice, because if I just needed a comb or a bottle of milk, it was right there. Now I've got to go a lot farther to do that. Your own room, like I talked about, Having your own space is really important and maybe the best part about living on your own and moving out. But the same vein is that's going to be more expensive. Furnished or unfurnished, you'll find places that are basically hotel rooms that have all the furniture you need. So you don't have to worry about that. The downside is you can't bring in your own furniture. If you've got your favorite lamp or your desk that you've had for the last 25 years, you can't have that and there's no space. Uh, talking about the lease, do you want something that you have a contract that's guaranteed for a long term, or do you want to just do it month to month? 
how long are you planning on moving out or being in the area? Um, and then any accessibility or special needs? Do you need a place that's really accessible to get to? Does it matter if you live on the first or second floor? Let me tell you if you're moving heavy furniture, it really matters if you're on the second or the first floor. Um, you have to weigh all those preferences. Mm -hmm. So before you do anything, that's that first step. You have to list up what do you want? How important is it to you? Can you give up something? Do you really need to live in a nice part of the town? If so, what might you have to give up? Uh, searching for housing. That's the next step, and that's the toughest step, and it took me, I want to say, three or four months to find my place. The best way to find housing is to ask your friends and your family, your coworkers, your teachers, if they know anybody who's looking to rent. Because a lot of times, but let's just be clear, landlords, whether they're like personal or professional, you know, whether they're just somebody who has extra room to rent or they inherit their mom's house, they don't want to rent it to anybody. It's a risk for them. So if they know you, or they know somebody who knows you who can vet for you, you're a safer bet, which means that you got a better deal. It also means that you'll find apartments that aren't listed anywhere else. That's what happened with me with my first apartment, is I was a friend of a librarian that I knew. And he gave me a great deal, and he was really great. He's still one of my friends to this day. I never had any problems with him. The people I was living with is another matter. But that's important. If you don't have any friends or family, things like housing groups, mailing lists, Facebook groups. Um, I found the Bay Area Rooms and Apartments, like Facebook group. There are great ways because, again, this is more personal. This is more social. People can share tips and tricks. Warn if there's a place that seems like a scam. It's really for you to learn. There's also rental agents if you're loaded, if you've got a lot of money. Um, they're not as common in San Jose as they are in bigger cities. San Francisco has some. Uh, LA has a ton. New York has a bunch as well. And there are people who help you find an apartment for a fee based on your preferences. Uh, I wish I had one because it was a lot of work. And then finally, there's rental websites, Trulia, Zillow, apartments.com, rentals.com. If you go to San Jose City's webpage, you'll find a ton of apartments there. Um, or the final one is Craigslist. Uh, and Craigslist, if you're not familiar with it, is sort of an online newspaper where everybody can put ads they're looking for help wanted or they're selling an apartment or looking to move an apartment. It's a great resource because there's no barriers to entry, but it's also a little bit more difficult to make sure the things you find are high quality or reliable. Does that make sense? When you're looking at spaces, you're going to see a lot of different terms and thinking about them, just to be aware if you see them, you know what they're doing. So, studios, does everyone know what a studio apartment is? So the idea of a studio apartment is there's no separate rooms. It's basically just one big room with your kitchen and your bedroom and your dining room all in one location. Uh, later on, we're going to do a little activity with a sheet, and I'll give you an example of a studio apartment. But that's probably the thing that's going to be most affordable. The downside is, it's a lot smaller. My first apartment room, not counting the kitchen, but I live in a special case, was smaller than that maker space right there. So you got to pay attention, you got to know what's going on. Apartments are what you're most likely to rent. Um, apartments are part of a larger building or property. A lot of things are shared among the tenants, so um, that means that sometimes your like water or garbage or electricity bill isn't independent. If somebody's wasting all the water, you kind of have to share the burden. Uh, but it also means that you don't have to replace the light bulbs, you don't have to do a lot of the maintenance, you don't have to mow the lawn because somebody else is being paid to do that. Condos you may see as well. Condos are normally purchased or leased on a long-term basis rather than just rented. Um, a lot of times you'll see on these Craigslist or the web pages condos available, then you'll look at the price and it's like, $800,000 or something. So it's something to be careful for. Because they're trying to sell you the whole property. Shared rooms and shared spaces. If you look and you find cheap apartments, it's almost certainly because of one of two things. One, you'd be sharing a room with somebody else. Or two, you'd be sharing some of the public spaces. Like I said, with my friends who all rented rooms in one house together, 
that was great because they all had their own rooms, but then they had to share the bathroom, the kitchen, if they're entertaining or having friends over. You know, you can't deal with that. In my case, I was sharing a kitchen and kind of a family area. And I can't tell you how many times I was like, all right, I'm going to go home. I'm going to cook a nice meal. I got this piece of chicken in the fridge. It's going to be good to go. I pull up, open the door, and they're cooking in there, and I can't cook. Or they're having a party, and I can't do that. And you can work with people and arrange schedules and plans and plot and um, like itineraries to say, well, I get the kitchen from 6 to 7, and you get it from 7 to 8. But then if you really need some food from 7 to 8, then you're out of luck. Uh, restrictions. A lot of people place pretty heavy restrictions on who can be in those apartments. They might be looking just for women or just for men or just people of a certain age. There's a lot of um, housing that's just available for senior citizens. Uh, they might have restrictions on the sort of pets you can bring or they might have pretty strict requirements about your noise level. Uh, sometimes they even say you can only have it Monday through Friday and then Saturday so you have to go somewhere else. Uh, and that's for people who might be like renting out a room in their house for some reason. So you want to make sure you know what those are ahead of time or you're going to get in trouble. And then finally, this one's kind of the good part of it, uh, rent control. So if you're not making a lot of money, there's a couple options for housing. And if you go to the San Jose City webpage and some of the Santa Clara County webpages, they have options of housing that is below market rate. So sometimes it's called BMR. Um, sometimes they just call it rent control. Sometimes it's not technically rent control, but you'll get a deal on it if you qualify by having a certain amount of money. So if you're not making a lot of money and you're having trouble, you can look for those places. For instance, the complex that I live in, um, I'm actually getting a several hundred dollar deal because I don't make enough money to qualify for how swanky the place is. It's still really expensive for me, but um, it's better than I would have to pay without that. All right, um, so it's important question is, can I live here? So if you have those sheets of paper, I want you to take it out, the studio apartment. And I want you just to think about that. That's all the space. Think about the stuff you have in your house right now. And how can you fit all that in there? If you have a pencil, if you want to try to draw in, like where your bed and everything is. Um, and maybe Zoe can go and get some pencils and bring them out. The front door is right there. So take a minute thinking about if you want to draw in those spaces. It was a big shock for me when I moved out of my parents' house into the first my apartment. Yeah. Um, so do you have another of the studio apartment? Yes, we do. Is that all you have? What? Hmm? There's a bed. What else do you have? What else do you want? Yeah, what do you need if you want to play? If you want to have to play video games, you probably need something to put your video games on, right? You need a TV. Where's your clothing going to go? Is all your clothing going to fit in a small closet like that? It, um, I didn't think I had that much clothing, but I had to actually get some extra storage space for all mine because my first closet was so small. Yeah, that's a closet. This is the door, right? That's the door. Wow, so the door's like that's the door. Yeah, this is really small. Yeah. That's the average size of a studio Not this. in San Jose. It's like a little bit smaller than the average size, but it's about that. Life size, not life size. It's not life size, it's the scale. So is this, what are these two? Those are like windows. Those are windows. Okay. It might also be a sliding door to a carrier. Is this how yours look like? Almost. So, if everyone thinking about that, you kind of see it's a little hard to fit in that space. I place. The bathroom opens right up to the kitchen. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's going to be kind of nasty. <laughs> kind of, Someone goes really that's bad. what it's like. My bathroom opens up right to my kitchen, too. But there's not a lot of place to put it if you're in a, um, if you're in a studio. I mean, yeah, but you could have put it like, there's not a lot of storage. right here. Yeah, there's really not a lot of storage. And there's really not a lot of storage for things other than clothing. Yeah. 
So like, if you have books, like I'm a librarian, who's surprised that I have a lot of books? You know, I can't really fit all my books in my house. I have to find some other places. Where's like the laundry and like all that stuff? It's a good question. We'll talk about. Some places have their own laundry, but this place doesn't have its own laundry. So there might either be a place that is shared by all the tenants, in which case, good luck. You gotta wait for like two hours for your laundry to finish washing and drying, or else somebody might take it. Or you gotta go to a laundromat, and that's another expense. You know, that's what fifty cents or a dollar per wash. A dollar seventy-five. A dollar seventy-five. Yeah, that's. Or you could like make the other people. You could like actually pay. You can hand wash it. Hand wash it in your, in your sink. Cool. You have to be careful. Maybe your sink's not deep enough to hand wash. Well, there's some Maybe you don't have to know how to hand wash. wash. Just exactly. Because of the material. Yeah. So I mean, these are all things you have to think about. But great ideas. All right. I just want to take a minute to do that. So um, now we're going to move on. And I'm going to talk briefly about the difference between leasing and month to month rent. Most places will want you to start with either a six month or a twelve month lease. Then after that, it'll move to month to month. And there's some advantages and disadvantages to both of those. Uh, when you're on a lease, that rent is locked in for that duration. Because you're signing a contract that says, I will pay this amount per month for this many months. So that means that you can't renegotiate to get it lower, and they can't raise the rents. Um, so that's a good thing. It's giving you some stability. Uh, the downside is when it expires, then it might go up. You have to stay for the full duration of that lease. You have to keep on paying that rent every month. If you leave, you have to pay a fee, and that fee is often pretty pricey. Um, you I to, think you have to pay a fee too. Uh, sometimes if you get evicted, you have to pay a fee. And normally, if you're evicted with cause, like you punched holes in all the walls or Don't cleared play. death metal at 3 a.m. every night, yeah. um, then you'll have to pay a fee and you'll be evicted as well. Um, that fee is usually the cost of a month or two rent, sometimes more than that. I think that's in my in my current place. It's two months rent, and I lose my deposit. And is it can it be like for every month you pay, you have to pay that over the whole amount? What do you mean? Like say if you pay like a hundred dollars a month, even though it's not very happen, but and you stay there for six months, you get a big you have to pay six hundred dollars. Uh, no, you don't have to pay six hundred dollars. It depends whatever the fee is when you agree. So the agreement might say if you get evicted, you have to pay $300. And then we get your deposit. Or you have to pay the difference between the months that you lived and that you're contracted for. So if it was a six month lease at $100 a month, and this is great, this is like a fantasy world. I'd love to live in that world. Um, but you get evicted after three months, then you'd have to pay $300. Uh, it provides security, and this is why landlords like it, and this is why you should like it too. Like I said, you know what the, you know what it's going to be, and they know that you're going to be here. You know, they know that there's going to be somebody in that space paying them mon uh, money every month. Now, month to month, there's no requirement to do that. Generally, you have to give them 30 or 60 days require notice before you leave, but then you can just leave. The downside is that at any time they could raise that. And often, it will happen a couple times if you're month to month. It's freedom for you and the landlord. But that's something to consider. What if you've got a job where your employer says, well, we love you here, but there's also a business in you know, Santa Cruz, and we're going to need you to go there in three months. You can't do a six-month lease, right? Because you're moving in three months. So that maybe you have to do month to month. Any questions about that? All right. So real talk, let's talk about rent. Rent sucks. I hate it. But it's a fact of life. Rent will increase. The longer you stay, the more times it's going to increase. Usually, it's going to increase by a maximum of 5 to 8% a year. You have rent? I'm just saying, uh, how much do you usually have to pay to live in a dorm in the, the university campus? That's a great question. I don't know that off the top of my head, but we can do some research at the end. Okay. I think it is just, I think it's like lower than a studio, but I don't know for sure. But generally, because, it is, right? I mean, oh, I'm saying because like someone told me that came to college and lived in a dorm, she said it was better off for her 
living mm. not in the cabins because it was more expensive. I'd, I'd have to see. Um, I don't know. It's probably because it was the, the college or university she went to. That's definitely true. And if there's nicer dorms, and some places have very nice dorms, some places have very not nice dorms. So are these um, prices for San Jose? Or? These are prices for San Jose. Okay. I looked these up today. So these are the average rents of studio, a one bedroom, and a two bedroom in San Jose. Remember, this is averaging both places that are, you know, full of rats, and also places that are super swanky and nice. So it's not always the greatest term. I'll say that I couldn't find a studio that was less than thirteen hundred dollars this year when I was looking. And some of those studios were in neighborhoods that I wouldn't want to live in. Like the hood? I mean, like rough parts, you know, parts of the, the city where there's a lot of shootings, parts of the cities where there's not a lot of stuff, you know, so maybe take you three miles to drive to like the next grocery store or convenience store. Um, places where that building is maybe from like the 1950s. So, you know, good luck getting modern plumbing or, yeah, really old. So that's downsides. Uh, the rent, uh, rent has increased dramatically, it's increased dramatically in a very short time. Like average rent for a uh, two bedroom, for a two bedroom, has increased by about a thousand dollars. In this case about over the last five or six years. So that's something else to pay attention to. And Tori, things have gotten really expensive really quick. That's not unique to San Jose, but it's something you'll have to pay into mind. You have to pay attention to. And the final thing is don't forget about hidden fees. Um, because you have to pay rent, but you also have to pay utilities. Um, that's like your water and your gas and your electricity. Maybe a recycling fee or a trash fee for them to take your trash away. Maybe a, ma a menu, uh, a landscaping or maintenance fee. Those won't be in the Craigslist ad or the Zillow ad but they're just as important. Sometimes also the advertising price that you see when you're talking to them isn't actually the price. Uh, for instance, my place was advertised at $100 less on the web pages than they actually charge. And apparently that's just what they do. They just advertise uh, for less, but when you actually want to sign the contract, they're like, oh, I'm sorry, we don't have any apartments for that price anymore, but there's this apartment for $100 more. So that's something to pay attention to. Yeah. Do you can you estimate like what an average um, amount would be for utilities? Oh uh, yeah, I'll get that in a little bit. But in San Jose, the average amount for utilities is about a hundred and ten dollars. But that's not including internet, which is basically a utility now. So that the average for that is about sixty-two. I think sixty-two oh eight. Okay. Um, and we could talk about there's some ways to bring that down, but it's difficult to really lower that. Like I said, in my my place. I pay for electricity uh, separately, but all my other utilities are averaged in with all the tenants in my building. So it means my water is an average of the water usage for the whole building. So I can't really do much to raise or lower that. If I don't use any water that month, I'm still paying a water fee. Once you find some places, you're going to want to interview and see those those spaces and those places. Um, you, you, there's a couple things you want to do beforehand. So the first thing is to know what information you're agreeing to share. These application processes are very intrusive for your personal information. Uh, sometimes they'll want references. Sometimes they'll want um, like social security numbers and things like that. They'll almost always want a driver's license. They may want to know what bank you have, what auto insurance you have. Of what business job you have, they'll run a credit background check all the time. They won't even trust your credit score. They'll they'll run it themselves. Usually, you'll have to sign something that says you give them permission to do a background check on you to make sure you're not like a secret felon or something like that. Um, they'll definitely ask you to list any crimes that you've been charged for, arrested. And once you go through the whole process, you don't have a lot of choice if you want that place. But when you're still doing that first thing where you're just checking out and getting scopes, you don't have to give all that information. 
So if somebody is on Craigslist and emails you, is like, hey, I know you want to see this place, I need your social security number, that's a red flag, don't do that. Um, I wouldn't send any information over the email, any personal information other than like a name or maybe a phone number, over email or text or something until you have a chance to talk to them and see the space and make sure that they're legit. You always want to look at the property first. And you want to look at the area around the property too. Um, the picture of that property might be beautiful. The apartment itself might be beautiful. Maybe it was just renovated. You go 10 blocks out and the whole area is um, not safe. There's a lot of crime reports and crime trackers you want to pay attention to. But also just to know what area that you live in, what are you comfortable with, um, who are you familiar with, because that's a big part of it too. If you feel like this is a community that you'd be safe in, a community that you would get along with the people in there, maybe you're different than somebody else who has the, who's in the same situation. Does that make sense? Um, you always want to meet face-to-face -face the landlord or the rental agent who's going to go through the process before you start giving personal information. They'll generally be very eager to meet with you and give you a tour, give you a real hard sell to sign the dotted line today, but don't sign anything sight unseen. You want to have some questions beforehand, and there's going to be the important questions that will show you what's important to you. So, big one is about utilities. How much do the utilities cost at this place? Do I have to pay them? Is it a shared cost? How about a guest policy? What if you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a mother or father that wants to stay over? Um, is there a policy? Can they, can they do that? Do they have to leave? Uh, is there official quiet hours? Do you have to be quiet from 10 to 6 p.m. 10 p.m. to 6 a.m.? Is there some special rule or restriction that might be um, something you don't want to do? You don't want to find it out after you've signed the dotted line or when they give you 12 pages of contracts to sign for the rental agreement. You want to find that out ahead of time. And also know things about customizing your space. Can you, put in whole, can you hang paintings? Can you drill holes in the walls? Um, what can I do? Can I change the carpet? You know, can I change the toilet if I don't like it? Know what limits they have on the space and what you want to do in that space. Know that we're in the Bay Area and there's going to be a high demand for apartments. So no matter what you do, even if the place is not your ideal location, if you wait too long, somebody else might snap it up. It's probably going to be a little bit more expensive than you want because the demand for apartments is so high in that area. So that's just me being real. You have to pay attention to that. And have a backup. And that is incredibly important. Even if you find like a dream home, like your perfect place, don't go all in on that. Don't commit. Something might fall through at the last minute. Maybe you don't want to live there anymore. Maybe you discovered that you actually hate the landlord. He was like your childhood bully or something like that. Now, there could be a lot of different situations. But also, if you're like, if your parents have given you three months to move out, or if your um, landlord says, you gotta get out by the end of the month, make sure that you have some other place you can go to for a little bit longer, so that deadline isn't preventing you from making a smart decision. Because when you move, especially if you're signing a lease, you're gonna be locked in that decision for a while. And if you're not happy, it's gonna really suck. So be careful. Uh, Bad department decisions. Here's some examples. I've already talked about most of these. They will probably make you charge a fee just to apply for the apartment. And they say that fee is for the background check. I think sometimes it's just to prevent you from applying from 50 different places. And that fee is non-refundable most of the time. Uh, if they're charging $25 or $50, that's okay. If their apartment fee is like $250, that's probably a scam how to avoid that place. Talk to other tenants at that place before you sign any agreements if possible. You know, knock on the door, introduce yourself, see, talk to somebody who's walking on the street. Look at the Yelp and the Facebook reviews of those online review sites. There's about 40 million of them online. See what they say. Don't rely on one review, but if 50 reviewers say the same thing, that's a sign that that's something that probably is really happening you have to worry about. Read all the documents that you're given and everything that has to be signed. 
because they'll sneak in things. I mean, this is a good, I'm sure this is an issue for any of you, but I had to sign all these different things. Um, for instance, I'm not, if I was, if I had medical marijuana, I'm not allowed to have that in my apartment. I just can't. It's, I had to sign a document that says that um, it's not allowed. So maybe there's a court case in that, but even though, if I didn't read through that quickly, if I didn't read through that carefully, then um, if I needed it, I'd be stuck. Now, void verbal agreements. That's really key, because they hold pretty much no weight. It doesn't matter if it's your best friend, or your brother, or, you know, Barack Obama. You can't trust any verbal agreement. You have to have something written down and signed by both of you. Because otherwise, there's no way, there's no reason that somebody that's going to change it. And that happens a lot. If you read bad reviews and things like that, generally something like that. Well, we had agreed that this had happened, and then he changed on me. Well, without a written agreement, you're out of luck. All right. So I want to move to talking about actually getting the apartment, those first steps afterwards. Um, your first day. I just talked about this. I'm re why do you think I'm reiterating to always read your lease? Always have it signed. And if there's not a lease, draw it up. That's incredibly important. Anything that you have to sign, any information that they give you, copy it, scan it, make sure you have it in a safe place. If there's a problem later on, if there's a disagreement about returning your deposit, you want to have that evidence that's documented. Do a walkthrough of the apartment with the person there. If there's anything that's wrong, point it out to them. Take a photograph of it. Because if otherwise, they'll say, oh, well, this hole in the wall, you did that. If like, there's already a hole, then you'll get the proof. I had to do that with my old place. There was like, it was a really old apartment, so there was a lot of damage in there. And I took pictures of everything. And in the end, I didn't have to pay a deposit. I didn't have to pay any of my deposit. I got the whole thing back. Because all the damage was pre-existing. Um, you're almost always going to have to do pay immediately a deposit in the first month's rent. Deposit tends to be anywhere from like $500 to the entirety of a, of a rent. So look at that first month. You're probably going to have to pay somewhere between like $2,000 to $3,000. So that's initial investment. Uh, now the deposit you will get back if you don't damage the place. But if you're going to have to have that money up front anyway. And most of the time, they don't accept a credit card. Um, so you need, and they almost never will accept a personal check. So you need to do that as a money order or cash. And I recommend money order just so you have, again, a trackable document. Utilities, internet, you may have to sign those up for yourself. I had to sign up for my internet. I had to sign up for um, my power. Like I said, I did a search, the average utilities goes about $114, and that ranges from like um, about $80 to about $140, depending. Some stuff you can reduce, like power usage you can reduce, sometimes water usage you can reduce, but you're still going to have to pay a fair chunk of money. Internet averages about $60 a month, um, and I, th I think we all know that that's kind of a uh, it's kind of essential nowadays. And renter's insurance. Do you want renter's insurance? Says? Insurance for renters. <clears throat> if possible, you want to get this. Because that does is that covers you if there is a problem. If there is a fire or a flood or um, there's a theft, you can insure your property and you'll get money back on that. So it's about $12 a month depending on what you do. A lot of places that do auto insurance will also do renter's insurance. So sometimes they can do a bundle deal with that. That's what I did. Um, but it's really worth it to do that because that's a peace of mind that if something bad happens, everything's not lost. You can at least get some of that money back. Yeah? So they don't actually fix it. They give you money and for you to pay for it to get fixed, right? So most of the time, they just give you money and pay for you to get it fixed. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, moving in, that's the next step. How much stuff do you have? How many boxes do you think it would take to put all your stuff in? Does anyone want to guess? 
Brennan? I'm guessing right now, like, I don't have much stuff, so I need like 10, 20. 10? Yeah. I take double it, like 20 boxes. One back there. <laughs> Think about, so when I moved out of my place, I had, like I said, I had that tiny, I had that tiny apartment. I didn't have a lot of stuff in there. So I bought like eight boxes. Like, all right, I'll put all my clothes in one box, all my books in these boxes. I had to go back to Home Depot twice to get more boxes to fit all my stuff in. And then I still didn't have everything because I didn't remember about some of my dishes and things. So I had a bunch of like tote bags that I carried in my car. Oh, yeah. You want to know how much stuff you have, if at all possible, pack it up like a week before you move. Think about how difficult it is to reach your apartment. If it's on the first floor, that's easy. If it's on the third floor, or if there's an elevator, maybe it's easy, but then how do you fit your bed or your bed frame in? If it's on the third floor and there's no elevator, there's just an external staircase, that could be a pain. I've helped my friends move, and I've moved couches up to the third floor on those things, and I don't recommend this, because it wasn't very safe, and it hurt a lot. So you want to know how difficult things are to move. Sometimes it might be worth it to hire somebody to do your moving for you. They're professionals, they're not going to break your stuff, um, and they're paid to move heavy stuff around. And finally, uh, think about what have you forgotten? What are you taking for your granted at your mom's house, or your dad's house, or your current apartment? Uh, what do you need that you don't have? So um, everyone's got that little checklist. I want you to take about three minutes and just write down everything you think uh, you need in there. If you don't have a blank checklist that's a full oh. page, um, Zoe will hand out some more. Yeah. Uh, everybody have one? She flies a post survey. Yes. Um. <clears throat> yeah, Everybody, another minute. How's it? Is it easy to think of this list? Is it hard? No, it's just like yeah. It's like you get down some of the bare essentials, then you like start kind of thinking, like kind of, kind of like one by one. Oh yeah, you also need this and this and this. Exactly. Um, it just keeps going on. Yeah, so let's just you put it down. I just wanted you to think about that. Um, here's a list of things that you got need in your apartment. This is one list. I printed this out. Here's a four-page list. Bed Bath and Beyond has one. You have that's a, lot like a six spaces. pages list. Hmm? You have a lot of spaces. Yeah, but that's to add things that you need, like your desk for playing War Thunder or your um, commemorative decorative plates. Really important things. I'm going to tell you about stuff that you're going to need that you're probably not going to remember on your day, day one. You're going to need trash can bags, trash bags. You're going to need a broom and a dustpan. Even if you're vacuum cleaner, you're still going to need a broom and a dustpan. You're going to need cleaning supplies. You're going to need extension cords or power strips for your stuff. Is it the first day or the... This is most of the stuff you're going to need real quick. Like, if you don't have trash bags on the first day, how are you going to uh, throw away your food? There is no food on there. That's another thing. If you don't have bed sheets, how are you going to sleep? If you don't have toilet paper sleep or napkins, like... How are you going to, you know, use the facilities? So it's like out. it's like stuff you just don't even think about. Exactly, and that's I mean, the thing. I, I didn't even thought about the emergency supplies. So it's, or the first aid. Yeah, first aid kits, emergency supplies, a uh, hamper to store your dirty clothes so it's not just a pile. Mm. I mean, so this is not absolutely essential, 
But most of it is. Like easier, like kind of yeah. more helpful kind of stuff. Uh, how about a lamp? There are no lights in my apartment. It doesn't really? say computer. Yeah. Like not even like a ceiling light? There's not a ceiling light. There's one in my kitchen, but that's it. So I had to buy lamps. I didn't think about that. that was one of the things that I forgot. I was like, ah, it'll be fine, right? There's no video game. There's no video games yet. We could add video games. Is there any stuff on this that I've missed? Anything you think that is essential? Oh, wow. oh it's cloth. Well, I mean, it was in like other stuff, like as you said, kind of like a router, right? Mm -hmm. Like for Wi-Fi. Yeah, internet router, mm -hmm. phone. Mm -hmm. yeah, tons of stuff, um, and some of that is going. You're gonna have. Here's something that I needed that I didn't. I needed like organizers for my shelves to fit all my dishes in the shelves, like extra storage racks and stuff like that. Because my shelf space isn't very good. And my mom, she had like these box things, right? It mm -hmm. was like these like square metal rods and they got like plastic like kind of strapped to it, right? Yeah. And so then there's like these corner things and you, get, you put it all together and it makes little cubicles, right? And yeah. You like just put stuff in there. They're just such a pain because my mom, like, she'd always have me, like every house we moved to, she'd always have me set them up and I'd see them. But they probably made life a lot easier once they're set up, right? Yeah. Um, once you've got your apartment, now it's the fun part. It's living in your apartment. And that's great, but... You learn? That, that's a hundred percent accurate representation of me. Deal with other people. No. But there's some things that you're going to encounter. So first is landlords. They're going to want to get paid. They may want to go in your apartment for various reasons. Landlords aren't allowed in your apartment without giving you notice. Um, but especially if it's somebody that you know, like if it's your friend's brother's sister, they may not know all the rules. They may just walk in one day, you go and they're fixing something, or they're going removing this flower pot that they accidentally left there. It's against the rules, but what do you do? Your neighbors, um, when you're working with your, you're going to be living with people in a close proximity. Hopefully they don't piss you off. Hopefully they don't play um, weird techno music at midnight, which is what happened to me the other day. So I needed a nice long sleep. And I put my head down, and it turns out that my bed is right next to the wall, which is apparently the wall that my neighbor used, has their speakers that play techno music on it. I couldn't even identify it. It drove me crazy. You just hear just like the bass. Just like yeah, exactly. And every once in a while, little like computer noises. <laughs> um, the space. That actually what's called lead me to thinking of camera. Uh, when you say a uh, landlord's going in without your position. Surveillance cameras. Surveillance cameras. Uh, surveillance cameras that are in your apartment are incredibly illegal, mm -hmm. um, like Increasing. criminal, criminal illegal. Why? So, because they can't film you without your permission. No. Outside. Outside. No, oh, you having your own. Oh, your own, yeah. Which is great as long as you as long as you have permission to do so. Um, maintenance. So, if you're in an apartment, or even if you're in a shared space. There might need to be maintenance in this space. Um, I'm not really allowed to change light bulbs or fix my garbage compactor. Uh, somebody has to do that. I have to make a scheduled appointment, and then they have to come in, and I have to worry about, did I leave all my dirty clothing in a big pile, and some guy's going to see this? Um, is it going to be fixed? If you're living in a place that's... My stuff. Are they going to take your stuff? Generally, you don't have to worry about that. Most places you have have pretty reliable maintenance people because if you don't have reliable people, no one's going to want to live there. But they may have to come in. They may have to come in and check your fire alarms, or they may have to turn off the water to your building to do some maintenance. These are things you'll have to deal with. Actually, the day before I had a big job interview, they turned off all the water for two hours in my apartment. So if that had been at a different time, I would have been really out of luck. And finally, like I said, noise. You have noisy neighbors. Sometimes you have like noisy people on that in the area. If you live close to the airport or a train track, you're gonna have to deal with those cases. Um, but if you do encounter problems, there's two big keys. The first one is to know your rights. Here at the library, we've got a ton of books that are like your rights as a tenant. 
We have a lot of resources online that SETI of San Jose and also the county web pages both have resources that tell you what rights you have as a tenant. Like I said, you have the right not to have your landlord come in all the time. You have a right not to be like subjected to unreasonable fees. When you're leaving, you have a right to get your deposit back unless they can prove that you did certain damages. Know those rights because no one's going to tell them you. No one's going to tell them you know. Um, and to communicate with your landlord. If you've got issues with other people, if you've got problems with the maintenance, if you think somebody took your stuff during like a maintenance operation, talk to your landlord and let them know about it. They have a vested interest in keeping you happy so you keep on paying them money, so you don't sue them, so you don't leave a, a one-star review on Craigslist or Yelp or anything like that. Um, Communication is key. That also will help make things better between you and your landlord. If your landlord knows you and likes you, they're going to be more lenient about different things. They might be more lenient about noise complaints that somebody does. They might be more lenient about raising the rent or giving you a little bit of extra time to pay. Uh, yeah. So when I was saying know your rights, where can we actually like find out? Um, where just like Google renters' rights or Google renters' rights or renters' rights in California? Okay. At the end, I'll show you a couple web pages that we have as well. Um, but also, the city of San Jose has a link to like housing rights, and also the county webpage has a link to housing rights as well. There's a ton of online resources about uh, moving into your first apartment. Every single web page and like magazine site has got like five things to know about moving into your first apartment or ten things you didn't expect about your first place. Check those out. They have great ideas. I learned a lot of what I needed to know from looking at those sorts of web pages. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Uh, you can ask me or a librarian to help you find information. You can ask your best buddy who moved out. You can ask your mom or your dad, because they probably remember what it was like to move into your first place. And they've got some good first-hand experience. And finally, just renting is awesome. I can't describe how nice it is to live on my own right now. Even though my rent is crazy high, even though you know, I have to deal with all this other stuff, just the feeling that it's my place, I own it. I can do whatever I want. You ready? Right it's so good. Because I'm renting. Yeah, but you say all right. Yeah, well, it's well, my because place. Because you live there. Yeah. Like, I live there. No one else is allowed in there without my permission. And it's great. So, um, that's my final thoughts. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah? So is this only for renting apartments, or is this could also all this knowledge could be used for renting houses as well? Same. You can use the same stuff for renting houses. It's almost the same process um, for something like renting houses. It's going to be a little bit dicier. Things about maintenance. Um, it might be dicier with things about subleasing. Like if you rented a house and you wanted to rent Angel a room, and rent me a room, and rent Brandon a room. Like there might be other things that your agreement, your landlord would have to deal with. But well, basically, the same thing. She probably owns the house. Yeah. Uh, Brandon. In general, what do you prefer saying you will live in? Like, what do you prefer? Like, for me? Yeah, and just a studio or like a house, living with someone. Hey, if I could afford it, I would love to live in a one bedroom apartment. It'd be really nice because it's a little cramped with the studio. It's sort of hard to put all the stuff in them. Because I want like a desk for my computer, but I want a place where I can play games or have dinner with my family. And I want my bedroom so I can shove all my clothing in there so no one sees it. You want all those like separate rooms? I want those separate rooms. But I love a studio. Personally, I don't intend to live with anybody except my wife. You know, when I get married, I'll live with them, no one else. And you going to have two? Yeah, him, maybe a dog. Um, but, but other than that, you know, it's a, personally, it's up to you. Uh, I can't tell you what you would like the most. I don't really need other people, like, I don't get really lonely when I'm by myself, but some people really like to talk to people all the time. Um, maybe that's a better space. I'm lucky enough that I can afford a studio in San Jose. If you can't, maybe that's not such a big deal. Maybe it's better to live uh, with a couple other people and spend that extra money on an Xbox. It's personal choice. Actually, personally, well, me, I'm just like, sorry to interrupt you, but I'm just saying, like, you gotta use your money wisely to, exactly. like, like, 
Yeah, the same. We have two hundred and fifty dollars. Like, I can buy, you know, buy food and like buy a, a stuff, or I can buy an Xbox. Mm -hmm. And or you can invest that, put it in your bank account, and then just you know, save. yeah, save it. Save. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, and in two weeks, we're going to talk about home survival. We'll talk a little bit about budgeting. We'll talk about that. But I'll just say from my own mental health perspective, I am mentally and physically healthier living by myself than in that previous place. A bad roommate can make your life miserable, but can also make you, like, sick and unable to do your job and unable to work. Um, so it's a trade-off. And there's no perfect solution for everybody, uh, but I think you guys can all do a great job.